In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In Randy's sermon last week, for those of you who were here to celebrate with us our Easter jubilation, Randy asked us to let Easter make us consider anew the good news in Christ. Randy, I took that challenge to heart, and the Holy Spirit placed in my heart a dreadful notion. Imagine the world without Christ's resurrection. Imagine the world without Christ's resurrection. And I don't mean that in an abstract or philosophical way. I mean, without the resurrection, sure, there wouldn't be a Christianity. Jesus would have been one of those other, many other Messiah-like figures who were crucified, crushed, and forgotten by all but historians. But what does no resurrection mean in an everyday, concrete reality kind of way? Imagine living in a Good Friday world and there being no hope. No call for a better world, no call for things to get better, just the crushing sense of defeat. Our reality in that Good Friday world would be that death does get the final say, that fear and hatred win, that there is little, if any, recourse for justice to overcome injustice, that love is just a foolish notion, that there is no hope, that life and creativity and beauty are all waiting to be ended by destructive forces. No resurrection. It means that our heads are forever bowed beneath the weight of oppression, whatever yours may be. It means that there's no point in even trying not to be sinful, for our sins only mount up in some ledger somewhere. But then, I think that doesn't matter either, because there, is, there would be no life in life and no life after death with no resurrection. And that reality makes my stomach drop to my feet. And then I realize that's the reality Thomas lived with. That stomach dropping reality is what Thomas must have felt. Thomas, like Jesus' other followers, believed Jesus' good news. That good news that means release for captives, relief for the poor, sight to the blind, and freedom to the oppressed, the jubilee year. These disciples put all that they had, all their hope, all their desire and longing for a world where God's loving kindness reigns and breaks in in the middle of Good Friday. They put all that they had on Jesus only to watch it all die on the cross with Jesus, mocked, scorned, belittled, even dehumanized. I cannot imagine, I can try, but I really can't imagine what it would have been like to have been a disciple in those dark hours. Maybe I would have felt deep grief Certainly. But maybe, too, I would have felt duped, betrayed by Jesus, angry at him for getting my hopes up, for making a promise that he didn't keep, angry at myself for believing him. Maybe I would have balked at the faith of the women, of the Marys and Joanna, and of Joseph of Arimathea and the others who stood by even after death to take care of his body, to wrap it in cloth and lay it in the tomb with spices. I don't know 
that my grief or my anger would have allowed me to stay there. And truly, the Gospels say that the disciples fled the scene, and Thomas must have been with them. And he must have been with the other disciples when they first heard the news, the good news of the risen Christ from Mary Magdalene. But, like the other disciples, Thomas didn't believe her. Maybe she hallucinated, they said, or been mistaken. Mary's delirious with grief. Can't trust anything those women say. The other disciples went up into the room. Their reaction was to lock the door out of fear, afraid that they would be next. Where did Thomas go? We don't know. The gospel doesn't tell us. And so I like to use my imagination to fill in the blanks. Sometimes, some years, I imagine that he went out into the streets to continue Jesus' work, taking care of the ill, taking care of the orphans and the widows. But this year, entertaining the scripture anew, I wonder if he was out wandering the streets in anger. Anger at Jesus. Jesus, who he believed had misled them, had abandoned them. Why do I think that? Well, we don't know what tone Thomas used when he said, I'll believe that he is risen when I can put my hands in his wounds. But having run a few different scenarios through my mind, I think he could have been angry. After all, you don't really go around sticking your fingers in people's wounds, be they dead or alive, unless you're a doctor. That's a great sign of invasiveness, if not disrespect. And Thomas was talking about repeating the very motions the soldiers had used to dehumanize Jesus as he died. Read this way, Thomas didn't just doubt that Jesus was resurrected, he outright rejected the idea with the force of bitter anger and scoffing. God had let him down again. Well, whether he was actually angry or not, Thomas did live with the reality that Christ was not risen for a full week. A full week that he was hanging out with the other disciples who were totally excited and elated and rejoicing because of their sighting of the risen Jesus. Thomas was alone in his world where death and injustice and oppression wins, where no one cares about those at the margins. Dwell with that. And now imagine the utter surprise and joy that Thomas must have felt at Jesus' appearance a week later. I doubt he had ever been so happy to be wrong in his life. And Jesus loved him despite being wrong. Maybe he ribbed him a little bit. But he brought new life to where anger and despair and grief had been. So overwhelmed with this new reality was Thomas that he is the first person to pull that 180 to declare the truth of who Jesus is. My Lord and my God, he says. This statement is profoundly important. The Jesuit priest James Martin wrote in the Wall Street Journal last week, what difference does Easter make in the life of the Christian? The message of Easter is, all at once, easy to understand, radical, subversive, and life-changing. Easter means that nothing is impossible with God. Moreover, that life triumphs over death, love triumphs over hatred, hope triumphs over despair, and that suffering is not the last word. Easter says above all that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he is Lord, and if you're a Christian, then what he says 
has a claim on you. His teachings are invitations to be sure, but they are also commands. Love your neighbors, forgive, care for the poor and the marginalized, live a simple life, put the needs of others before your own." End quote. In a Good Friday world, there is nothing more defiant than resurrection. And there is nothing more defiant in the face of death and destruction than rebirth. Baptism is a refusal to allow death to get the final word. Baptism is our joining with Christ in his act of defiance. Blessed are those who have not yet seen yet believe, Jesus says. And that's us. And that's every Christian since those first apostles who saw. We are all Thomas. We all have questions, and that's good. We all experience tragedy. We all, at some point or another, might be angry at God. And that's okay. Because baptism means that we keep bringing that to God and asking God to bless it and sanctify it and turn it around. Baptism is powerful, and we are people of baptism and of resurrection and of Easter. And I was reminded last week of this parish's great moment of resurrection. Barbara Brown Taylor, the, the Episcopal priest and popular writer, wrote, I am thinking of St. James's Church in Richmond which burned in 1994. Established in the 1700s, it was one of the oldest churches in the city when lightning struck the steeple during a summer thunderstorm. Before anyone could respond, everything burned up, the pews, the prayer books, the organ, the altar. The next Sunday was Baptism Sunday. And do you know what those people did? They put up tents in the street and baptized babies while they stood in the ashes of their ruined church. Baptism is something we live. And today, we will continue in that ancient act of defiance as we baptize seven people. Seven, four at this service and three at the next. Seven people will die with Christ, refusing to, to allow that death is the final answer. And they, those seven people, will rise again with Christ to God's true reality, where life is the final answer. God's love and resurrection, after all, is the most powerful force in this world, in this universe. And we are invited in our baptisms to participate in that resurrection through a simple, quiet, beautiful, yet powerful act. Thanks be to God. Amen.